a sizable enough group to start. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. Great. Well, uh, welcome to 85 years of the Heather Garden. Uh, I'm Jennifer Hoppe. I'm the administrator for Northern Manhattan Parks for the Parks Department. And I'm also the executive director of the, Conserv the Small Conservancy for Fort Tryon Park, the Fort Tryon Park Trust, which is sponsoring uh, this program tonight uh, with help through the Green Acre Foundation. Um, we are, have entered a huge milestone for Fort Tryon Park in its 85th year. Uh, in mid-October, uh, we'll be celebrating its birthday. And as part of a series of events, uh, commemorating um, and celebrating this significant milestone we've been putting on various programs. Um, this Fort Tryon Park is one of 10 scenic landmarks in all of New York City, but we think it's the best. <laughs> um, the Olmsted brothers designed it for John D. Rockefeller Jr. Uh, and their, the main thrust of their design approach was social equity and bringing beauty to the masses. Um, so all of you, I hope, have experienced firsthand uh, the beauty of uh, Fort Tryon and its 67 acres. If you haven't, tonight we have the delight of having public garden designer uh, Rhonda M. Brands help us take a walk through history, uh, the history of, of uh, Heather Garden, Reacre Garden, uh, nestled within the park. Um, and. Uh, various stages and seasons uh, in, its, in its long life of 85 years. Um, the, uh, just a little bit about Rhonda, she's designed both public and uh, small gardens, large gardens, campus settings uh, in the tri-state region. And we're so fortunate, um, the Fort Tryon Trust hired Rhonda and her partner at the time, Lyndon B. Miller to come up with uh, a framework plan for the Heather Garden, essentially a management plan uh, for this wonderful garden. And we've been working with her ever since, uh, along with our, our talented horticultural staff. Um, John Kelly's our director of horticulture. Uh, yes, John. And uh, our wonderful Parks Department partners um, and uh, fabulous Heather Garden volunteers, many of, of who are are also on this call. Um, so welcome and thank you for being with us tonight. We are going to put this up on the Fort Tryon Trust, Trust website. Uh, just a few housekeeping items. I just want to make sure everyone uh, keeps themselves muted. Uh, Rhonda does not have full voice tonight and we want everyone to get the benefit of her knowledge, and her passion, and, and everything she's going to share. Um, so please do uh, keep yourself muted. We are going to go through a quick uh, a presentation and at the end, there's going to be room for uh, questions and answers. And obviously, at that point in time, um, we'll uh, want all of you to be unmuted and we'll do the, the hand raising uh, thing to, and I'll, I'll, I'll moderate questions. Um, if you're someone who is concerned you might not be able to hold on to your question that long, um, feel free to use the chat feature. I'll also be monitoring that uh, and helping Rhonda during the Q&A. Again, welcome. Help us celebrate 85 years of the Heather Garden. Um, and uh, we're so glad you could be here with us tonight. Great. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Well, as Jennifer mentioned, I have had the very good fortune to be associated with the Heather Garden for nearly 11 years now. And I want to thank Jennifer and the Fort Tryon Park Trust for supporting my long association with this beautiful place and for sponsoring the talk tonight. I wish I could see all of your faces at once. I know so many of you are regular Heather Garden visitors. Uh, some of you are daily visitors. And I, I've seen uh, volunteers here online with us, uh, board members, neighbors who have been on tours with me. Uh, most of you have been many times to the Heather Garden and you know it so well. But at least this format allows friends and colleagues to join us who have not yet been to the garden. So uh, welcome to all of you. If you haven't had the chance to visit, as Jennifer said, the Heather Garden is a three acre space and it's set within the 67 acres of Fort Tryon Park. And that's all situated in the northern part of Manhattan. And uh, Manhattan in the northern part, it, the land rises up on a bluff about 200 feet above the Hudson River. 
The photo that you see on the top here shows the Heather Garden after it was first planted in 1935. The photo on the bottom is of the Heather Garden today. So clearly a lot has changed over these past 85 years. As all of you gardeners out there know, gardeners are, uh, gardens are ever changing. I mean, plants are living and growing and dying. Conditions change. And over a long period, many different people might be involved in the management of a public garden space. So tonight we're going to take a look at the key changes in the Heather Garden, starting in the 1930s with the Olmsted Brothers design through um, a period of decline in the garden from the 1950s to the early 1980s, then through the 1983 restoration, the establishment of the trust in the 1990s, and the garden's reinvigoration in 2010, or in the 2010s, I should say, a number of years then. Uh, also, I just mentioned, if you are looking at the screen and if the little thumbnail uh, um, on the side, the, the film of all of our faces, if that gets in the way of your seeing any of the photos on the screen, you can just use your cursor to move those aside one way or the other. So I just wanted to mention that. I tried to keep most of the words where you'd be able to see them, but um, you might wanna see some details in the photos. While we don't have a lot of time today to get into depth about the land's history prior to the creation of the garden, but I wanted to show you this screenshot, which is from something called the Manhattan Project which attempted to depict Manhattan during the 1600s, around the time when Henry Hudson sailed up the river in 1609. Uh, you know, for centuries before the Dutch took control of the land in the 1700s, much of this area was heavily forested, as you see here. There, it was really robust with wildlife and plant life. And if you go to this wallachia.org site, you can look at, um, these uh, imaginings of what Manhattan looked like in 1609. And you can also investigate what types of plants and animals would have been in these areas at that time. The Lenape tribes that lived here were expert botanists. They used plants for food and medicine and they held a deep respect for nature. The inset that is in the upper left is showing the palisades across the river. So when you look across the Hudson, you see the Palisades, and this depicts what the Palisades would have looked like um, centuries ago. Later during the Revolutionary War, this same land was a key battle site. And we're looking right now at a depiction of the attack against Fort Washington in 1776. So you can see what the topography of the land is like where Fort Tryon Park is now and where the Heather Garden is situated. So this uh, revolutionary time is really a very rich history worth a whole hour and more on its own. So we can't get into that now. But during the time of the Revolutionary War, trees were cleared from some of the land. Uh, so the forests still existed, but it was a little bit sparser. Um, for, they used it for firewood and for building fortifications. And also, uh, farms were starting to be built on the land, and, and some of the land was used as farmland, especially as you got north into Inwood, some of the flatter areas down below the hills. And the inset on the upper right shows the Dykeman House. Um, it's a farmhouse in Inwood, and the picture is from the 1890s, but you can still visit that farmhouse today. It still exists in Upper Manhattan. So the land was changing into farmland at that time, and uh, that was through kind of the 1700s and into the 1800s. Now the landscape was changing even further uh, during the 19th and the early 20th centuries when wealthy families began to establish these grand estates in Washington Heights and in Inwood. Uh, Upper Manhattan was really considered the countryside back then. So shown here we have in the top two photos, this is Woodcliffe, and later it was called Libby Castle. Boss Tweed was one of the famous owners of the Libby Castle over the years. And if you, those of you who know the area, you can see that this is the Margaret, what we now call the Margaret Corbin Circle area. And if you look at the bottom two photos, those are pictures of the Billings Estate. And uh, this was called Tryon Hall. 
CKG Billings built this from 1901 to 1905, a very elaborate estate. And if you look at that photo on the bottom right, that's, I, th I think, called the fountain room. So you can imagine how elaborate the estate was inside. There was the fountain room. Uh, he had not only a billiards room, but uh, an indoor bowling alley, an indoor swimming pool. He would sometimes invite people on horseback to go come into the estate inside for dinner and they would be served dinner while they were on horseback. So he was a very eccentric character. And if you want to learn more about this time period, it's so interesting in this area. Uh, the Met Museum has an online resource called A Neighborhood of Castles in the Sky, Washington Heights Before the Cloisters. And also you can go to myinwood.net and you can see pictures of the CKG Billings estate. Now the Billings estate stood on what is now Fort Tryon Park. So in this photo, we're looking north as if we're standing on Cabrini. And can you imagine where the Heather Garden is today? I would say it's probably right about here where I'm showing you the blue circle. So the mansion itself burned to the ground in 1926, but the gatehouse, some original estate walls, the grand entrance arcade and the long driveway, um, those all remained. And later they were used, they were integrated into the park design. And you can see those elements in the park today. Those of you have, who have been down to the Billings Arcade, which has been restored and it's just beautiful. So this photo is of philanthropist John D. Rockefeller Jr. on the right and his father is seated on the left. And when Rockefeller Jr. was a child, he had taken walks in the Fort Tryon area with his father and he loved the atmosphere of the hills. Since it's a little bit hard from this photo to imagine these two fellows walking in the woods, um, I also am adding here a photo of Rockefeller Jr. with his son, Winthrop, and they're pictured here in Acadia in Maine, where the Rockefellers had property. So in 1917, Rockefeller Jr. purchased the Billings estate that we saw earlier, and also Libby Castle and one or two other estate tracts. And he had the intention to preserve these areas for what he called a tranquil respite from urban life. He wanted to gift the land to the city to create a public park. Well, the city was in no position to accept land that wasn't already developed into a park. So in 1927, Rockefeller contacted the Olmsted Brothers firm to develop a park on the property. By this time, at 19, in 1927, Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. was the lead at the firm. His brother had, his stepbrother had passed away in 1920. So the two brothers were the sons of Frederick Law Olmsted the force behind so many public parks that we know across the country, and also the co-designer of Central Park with Calvert Vox. So in, prepara in preparation for this um, Fort Tryon Park project, Olmsted Jr. traveled to Europe and he studied similar parks with rocky topography and thin soils. And I would love to do more research to try to find out what parks he visited. It would be so interesting to know what specifically he found as inspiration for Fort Tryon Park. This fellow, James W. Dawson, he created the planting plan for the park. He was the son of the Arnold Arboretum's superintendent, and he also had studied landscapes abroad. And just as an aside, I worked for a time at the Arnold Arboretum before I moved from Boston to New York, and it's a wonderful place if you haven't visited and has a very rich history of its own. So these two plantsmen were really you know, knowledgeable. They were designers. They knew plants. They were very experienced in creating public landscapes. This quote from Olmsted Jr. is about Fort Tryon Park as a whole. And I'm just going to read it, and we'll talk about some of the elements in it. Each unit in this intricate series of places should offer a picture of as great perfection as can be contrived, 
using the same great distant views over the Hudson and over the city again and again, but framing them differently. Presenting them with constantly differing types of foreground, some intricate and intimate, some grandiose and simple, some richly architectural or gardenesque, some picturesquely naturalistic, and by way of contrast, some presenting wholly self-contained scenes. Well, there's a lot in there, but what he's referencing is the style of the 18th century English landscape, the naturalistic romantic tradition. And that tradition involved elements of what they called the beautiful, the sublime, the picturesque, and the gardenesque. And we can't go into a lot of detail about what those are tonight, but in particular, I wanna mention that the gardenesque refers to when we use plants as art. And this is a little bit different from what we call the picturesque, which is when we are maybe noticing a very naturalistic scene or we're creating something that looks very naturalistic, uh, like a wooded slope, maybe with a craggy tree or something like that. So that's the difference between um, the gardenesque and the picturesque. And really this style, which as I said was 18th century, it was kind of a reaction to the late Victorian style, which involved exotic specimen plants and carpet bedding. It was hearkening back to those of you who know your landscape design to Capability Brown, Humphrey Repton, the whole concept of genius loci uh, that was popularized by Alexander Pope in poetry. Uh, Pope wrote, consult the genius of the place in all things. So the plan was to be the fusion of natural features, and that would be the genius of the place, with landscaped features, with two key horticultural destinations, the Heather Garden and the Alpine Garden. And the Heather Garden was really what was considered gardenesque. So we're focusing tonight on the Heather Garden, but it's important to look at the context of where it's built. Here's an early plan and a model of the park with the approximate location of the Heather Garden circled in blue. You can see from the model that they're working with the terrain, with the topography. So like his father before him, Olmsted Jr. believed that the natural features, the conditions of the land should be preserved where possible. So theoretically, the park gets designed around the terrain. Now I say theoretically because you will see that they were not averse to moving lots of earth and rocks to make it look natural or to enhance nature. As a matter of fact, if we go back to the quote on the earlier slide, note the words, as great perfection as can be contrived. So the, na the natural is the inspiration but you can manipulate things to enhance the look of nature or to make it look even more like you think it would look as natural. And in fact, when you think about it, um, you know, when, when you see natural landscapes or gardens, many natural gardens often take more effort and maintenance behind the scenes to make them appear that way. So the Olmsted firm spent four years from 1931 to 1935, transforming this rocky topography into a park landscape. Now, 1931 to 1935, that was during the depression. So Rockefeller Jr. was primarily funding this effort and it was employing up to 350 men a day creating this park. The work involved grading, slope construction, building stone walls and stairs and promenades, terraces, eight miles of pedestrian paths. So the photo on the left, you see the um, entrance pillars to the garden at the south end. And what they're doing there, they're making mock -up, uh, um, a mock-up of the walls out of burlap. And then they also created wooded slopes and they preserved open areas. They moved rocks and huge trees they transplanted about 180 fully grown mature trees and they planted more than 1600 plant species. I love the photo on the right. Look at the size of that tree. 
I can't imagine even moving it now, let alone back then with the equipment that they had. So it's amazing. And I wanted to mention to you that if you'd like to view more of these historic photos, you can go to the Fort Tryon Park Trust website, which is forttryonparktrust.org. And when you're reading about the history of the park, you'll also see a link that will take you to um, the photos that have been digitized by the Met Museum. And these are in an album that the Olmsted Brothers firm made. So they took pictures and they made these albums and the Met has one, I think there's one at the New York Historical Society and then um, the Olmsted archives have a lot of these photos as well. This is a view of where the Heather Garden is today. We're looking south as if you're standing on Linden Terrace and you'll note on the left the allay of American elm trees and the promenade where the, that group is standing. And the Heather Garden would be sitting about in the middle where the building is. And the building is a, a temporary field office that they created. Here's a similar view after the garden was completed. Now we have a black and white photo here, so we have to use our imagination. They were using colorful plants that that were utilized as a foreground to views of the George Washington Bridge, of the Hudson River, and of the Palisades. In 1935, Rockefeller Jr. presented the completed park as a gift to New York City. And here is the opening day parade, Columbus Day, October 1935, along the promenade with the Heather Garden on the right. So just to orient ourselves, you see uh, the Elm Allay, and the garden is made up, and this is especially for those of you who haven't been to the garden, I just wanna orient you a little bit. You've got um, a, a 600 foot perennial bed. Uh, we call it the perennial bed, but it's a mix of shrubs and perennials. And it's backed by a privet hedge all along that way. And then you've got a central path and then something we call the heather bed on the other side. And the heather bed has mostly heaths and heathers combined with companion plants. And we'll talk more about these elements as we go forward, but I wanted to get you oriented. So in this picture, we're looking from north to south. So what was the inspiration for the design? What was the design intent for this garden? We know that Olmsted Jr. and Dawson were greatly influenced by the European naturalistic romantic style, and they studied ways to adapt it to this unique site. But more specifically, how would we characterize the garden? And before we do that, I'm just showing you, there's the heather bed, the perennial bed, and the triangle. We are now looking from south to north, so get you oriented there, the river is on the left. Well, we know that the garden is, as we said, gardenesque, and what we meant by that was that it, the plants were being used as art. It has a lush and romantic and rustic feel. Lush plantings, um, that's a hallmark of the Olmsted principle, the Olmsted firm. They like to plant very lushly. Also, the plantings take advantage of the topography and the slopes. We have open views and the plants also frame views, so views are a very important part of the garden. The plants are used to create interest in all four seasons. And the way you do that is with a diversity of plants to get your seasonality. Also, even though this is a black and white photo, I think you can tell that the plants are planted in large groupings, in swaths. You have rivers of plants. You can also tell that there's some repetition artfully done in order to create a sense of cohesion in this space. And again, even though it's black and white, I think you can see that foliage contrast is important. It's not just about flowers blooming. The foliage textures um, and shapes really matter in the design of the space. And also, 
a collection of heaths and heathers, which might seem a rather unusual choice for New York City. Why heaths and heathers? Why were they chosen? Well, heaths and heathers are low growing evergreen shrubs and they thrive in bare open areas. There are over a thousand cultivars of heaths and heathers and not even a small portion of that is available you know, at the nursery. But in the garden today, we have over 30 cultivars or types of heaths and heathers in the garden. Now, heaths and heathers are not native to uh, North America. They're native to uh, Europe. We think of them as, as being in Scotland and also parts of, um, of Asia and many other places, but, but not here. So for us here in New York, Heaths in general, and heaths are in the genus Erica, they bloom in the late winter and the early spring, and you see a picture of the heaths in bloom on the upper left. And heathers, generally for us, are blooming in the summer and into the early fall, so you can see a picture of the heather, which is the genus Coluna, um, blooming uh, on the upper right-hand photo. The foliage is green year round, but, and, and you can see how the, uh, the kind of undulating masses of heaths and heathers can form this beautiful green carpet. And you uh, can look at the lower left-hand photo for that. But also some of the heathers in particular have colorful foliage all year round. Some of them have yellow, uh, like a cultivar called violi gold or Gold haze also has yellow foliage all year round. So the picture on the lower right hand side, you can see the yellow foliage of the heather. And others have foliage that turns color in the winter, sometimes yellow, silver, bronze, or reddish like firefly and winter chocolate. I love these names. Uh, heaths and heathers have a lot of terrific cultivar names. So you can get a year-round effect using a wide variety of heaths and heathers. You can see how important they are to the structure and to the color of the garden in the winter. So really, they're a great choice for four season interest, but also their low height preserves views of the Hudson River from the promenade and from the, other, uh, from the upper path. And they capitalize on that sloped topography. Now I have one other thought about the heaths and heathers. Remember this photograph of Rockefeller Jr. and his son in Maine, in Acadia. And I've added on the right a photo showing a certain aspect of the Maine landscape in Acadia. I don't have any evidence for this, but I really think that Rockefeller Jr.'s time in Acadia contributed to the design vision for the Heather Garden. I've spent a lot of time in Maine and I know some friends here tuning in have spent time there too. And if you think about that main landscape, it's very evocative of certain elements of how the Heather Garden is planted. Now, of course, Rockefeller Jr. wasn't technically one of the designers of the Heather Garden, I should point that out. And I don't know what conversations he had with Olmsted Jr. and with Dawson, but I just really feel this connection with that main landscape. I'm sorry this picture is so blurry. Uh, it, it was blurry in a small size as well. But if you see in the foreground uh, a gardener with a wheelbarrow, well, when the Heather Garden was created, the park employed 17 staff and gardeners just for Fort Tryon Park. Imagine that, 17. So today there are six gardeners for all of Northern Manhattan's 660 acres of green space, 10 times the acreage of Fort Tryon Park, six gardeners. The garden and park had been built at the time largely with Rockefeller's private funds, although the city had to contribute a fair amount for infrastructure. So it was a partnership, but the city could not manage over the long term to staff the park at the 1930s level. And over the years, the garden began to decline. In 1955, the garden remodel did not take the Olmsted designs into consideration, and the garden became overgrown with invasive species. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to locate a photo of the garden during that time. So if any of you 
history mavens out there have one, uh, let me know. The photo on the upper left is a still from the 1968 Clint Eastwood film called Coogan's Bluff. The film featured a motorcycle chase scene through the Heather Garden. So you can imagine the state of affairs of the garden at that time. You can kind of see it in the, back, the background, but you can imagine. During the 1970s, the city of New York suffered a severe budget crisis. Funds for parks were decimated. Maintenance declined even further. So in these pictures, you can see um, the graffiti on the walls leading up to the Linden Terrace. And in the bottom photos, the garden as we're headed, heading into the early 80s. So by the early 1980s, this is the Heather Garden. Plantings and river views were obscured by years of unmanaged growth. And I'll just leave that photo on the screen for a moment because it's just amazing to look at it, at what it, what it looked like at that point. So the decline continued until 1983 when funds became available for restoration. And that was the year when the park was designated an official New York City landmark and the landscape restoration plan was created. And in this picture, we see them starting to clear out the overgrown plantings. This looks daunting. <laughs> Those of you who've been working on uh, restoration of the garden for years, doesn't this look daunting? So you can see that this was a very thorough restoration, basically starting almost from scratch. The project was accomplished through New York City Parks with funding from the Green, Ar Green Acre Foundation. And the Green Acre Foundation was founded by the, Rockefe the Rockefeller family, um, I think by Rockefeller Jr.'s only, only daughter, Abby, and continued um, with family funds. And so the foundation initiated this uh, restoration of the garden and they, uh, they were um, bringing in Nicholas Quinnell from Quinnell Rothschild and Partners and uh, Nicholas Quinnell was a landscape architect and, or is a landscape architect and a trust board member. And also Jane Shackett, who was the uh, former New York City Parks Administrator, she carefully oversaw the restoration. So the plan was created um, by Quinnell and Associates. And clearly you can see from the pictures that volunteers were participating to help make this happen. So in this restoration, they adhered to the guidance of the 1935 Olmsted plan, and they focused on adding plant varieties and extending bloom time. And I would just mention to you that if you go to YouTube and you type in Nicholas Quinnell Projects Fort Tryon, there's a wonderful short video of uh, Nicholas Quinnell speaking about this Fort Tryon project about the Heather Garden specifically and the renovation in 1983. And it's informative and it's lovely. So I just mentioned it to you. You might wanna check that out. So to keep the momentum going after the 1980s restoration, former Parks Commissioner Adrian Benepe spearheaded the formation of the Heather Garden Committee. A number of other key supporters joined him, including park neighbor and our most enthusiastic park cheerleader, Dr. Ruth. I love the picture of the two of them. In 1998, that committee became what we now know as the Fort Tryon Park Trust. So the garden is cared for now by a partnership between New York City Parks and the Trust. So as the city's budget rises or falls, so too does the state of our parks and the trust aims to help mitigate those effects by raising endowment, leveraging funds, tackling capital improvements, organizing programming, and supplementing parks budget for staff, supplies, equipment, and plants. And also, gratefully, the Green Acre Foundation helps many gardens and green spaces throughout New York City with funding as well. So we're so grateful for them. But even after the 1980s restoration, it was really difficult to keep up the garden. 
not having those 17 gardeners on hand anymore. And again, you gardeners out there, you know um, how fast this can happen in the garden. There were still many beautiful elements in the garden and it had been passionately cared for by the few gardeners who had worked there over the years. But as you can see from these photos um, from early 2000s, that the garden had gotten a little fuzzy around the edges and it had lost some of the structure and the contrast and the seasonality. So in 2009, the trust engaged Lyndon Miller and me to reinvigorate the planting plan and to develop a framework plan to help sustain the garden over the longer term. So the bulk of this reinvigoration was from 2009 to 2014 when Lyndon Miller and I were working on um, particularly the perennial bed and getting the framework plan into place. And then from 2014, to um, 2018, I continued to work as a project manager with the gardeners and we tackled the heather bed, uh, a lot of a restoration that was still needed in that really big bed um, on the other side of the path. Most of you probably know Lyndon Miller and her work. She is an icon of public garden design in New York City and beyond. Uh, she was and, and is my mentor in so many ways. And she and I have partnered on dozens of projects through the years. So in the left-hand picture, you see me with Lyndon, and we are here with Marcia Garibaldi, who was the gardener that we began working with in particular at that time. And Marcia had worked for many years on the garden, and she was a passionate um, lover of the garden and a wonderful gardener. So Lyndon and I both specialize in, guide, uh, in gardens that are designed for the public, and the Heather Garden is the largest public garden with unrestricted access in New York City. But the point that I'm making in this slide is that we were not working alone. We met and worked with the Heather Garden gardeners trying to absorb their knowledge of the garden's problems and strengths, mapping out the existing conditions, compiling year-round bloom lists, I don't have room here to show you all the terrific staff who've worked on the re reinvigoration through the years. But as I mentioned, we, we see Marcia Garibaldi here. And then in the upper right hand, I'm sure that many of you remember Neil and Dorothy. And uh, in the middle picture, there's a picture of John Kelly. We are so incredibly lucky to have John Kelly today. He is an incredibly talented gardener, and now he's the landscape coordinator for Northern Manhattan. In the lower right, you see a picture of Jennifer Hoppe with Adrian Benepe. Through all of this, Jennifer Hoppe, who's the executive director of the trust and administrator of Northern Manhattan Parks, Jennifer has been the catalyst, the inspiration, and the tireless advocate for the garden. Eventually, we were able to build a strong volunteer team, which is now led by John Kelly. And the volunteers help not only with maintenance, but with large scale plantings and with other projects. There is no way that the garden would look the way it does today without the work of the volunteers. So it really takes a village to do this kind of work. So how could we restore the design intent of the garden and evolve the garden in response to everything that has changed since 1935. Sure, it's the same three acre plot with seasonal diversity and one of the largest teeth and heather collections in the Northeast and that 600 long, foot long perennial border, but the context has changed. The trees have grown large and blocked views of the river in many places. The trees have created areas of sun and shade that are different from 1935. The soils have deepened and grown richer and the climate has changed drastically. Also, plants that were available at nurseries in 1935, not all the same plants that are available today. We have quite a different palette of plants available to us now. So what we needed to do is we began by establishing guiding principles for our team and hopefully for posterity. 
we had to lay out a shared vision for the garden, something that was rooted in the spirit of the 1935 Olmsted Brothers design. So these guiding principles were many and they were very detailed, but I'm going to touch on just a few of them in the time that we have left tonight. We were very focused on fine tuning the idea of seasonal interest. And what you're looking at here is I put together uh, this sort of concept slide in 2015 when we were reinvigorating the heather bed to show how the seasonality of the heather bed isn't just about winter, spring, summer, fall. You can think of seasonality um, and four season interest in, in a more fine tuned way every month or even every week, what's of interest in the garden at those different times. And also I sh I'm showing here the diversity of conditions in the heather bed. So uh, we have different kinds of soil and then across the path in the perennial bed, we have different conditions as well. So then I would create these plant palettes for each season. And I'm showing just the example of spring here. But the reason I would create the plant palettes is to try to evoke the colors and the textures of the season. And then from there, carefully choose and recommend new types of plants that we could add to the garden to augment this four season framework. So I know those of you who work in the garden and go every day, you recognize some of these plants that we've added in the last number of years, like the different kinds of Gora and the Salvia May Night and the Yellow Queen Aquilegia and um, so many plants that I'm sure you're all familiar with today. Another goal was to rebuild the garden's architecture, which you do mostly with shrubs. Uh, so this really helps create winter interest. Usually I start designing by thinking about winter first. You try to get the structure of the space in mind for winter. And you can see how the textures and the shapes and the colors really bring the landscape alive in the winter. And then on through the seasons, fine tuning through early spring, adding bulbs, into azalea season, we added a lot of companion plants for azaleas. And then through into that area between spring and summer, you need plants that bridge the gap between spring and summer. You notice that salvia may night there that we had seen on the early, er, earlier slide, that's the dark purple in the middle ground. And you can see how that salvia works as a repeat in the garden and also mirrors other colors like, I mean, similar colors like the Siberian iris that you see in the middle ground of that photo. On through the dog days of summer, where we had a lot of that fabulous red Crocosmia lucifer blooming and we wanted to add plants to uh, complement that like the Gora, the white Gora that you see in the middle ground and the pink Gora that you see in the foreground. And if I had to pick a season, this might be my favorite. This is late fall. And I love late fall in the garden because you have the changing of the colors of the leaves, not only in the trees and the shrubs, but if you leave a lot of that perennial foliage up long enough, we get some beautiful colors from the foliage of the perennials too. Now, one of the ways that you, create this four season effect when you're fine tuning is through strong plant combinations. That's the key to the fine tuning. And that is so much fun in garden design. Those of you who do this in your own gardens, you know how much fun it is to put combinations of plants together so that one plant might be great in and of itself, but you combine it with another plant and wow, you know, it really sings. So uh, we were putting combinations together and one thing to keep in mind about plant combinations, it's not just about flowers, it's also about foliage. And if you notice in these pictures how important good foliage contrast can be, it can be very effective. 
another thing that we were trying to do, use plants to solve problems. So plants along the edge of the paths, if they're very lush and robust, it helps the garden look well maintained and it makes the whole garden look lush. So one of the things that I did was uh, kind of take an inventory of all the edging plants around the heather bed and then suggest some additions that we could add along the edge to really beef up and make sure that the edge looks good at all times. And you can see from these photos how important that is. Um, that lush look is really benefited by um, the plants looking um, very continuous along the edge. Now, we also had to find ways to maintain the collection of the heaths and heathers, and this became increasingly difficult with climate change. This is kind of a complicated topic, so I won't go into detail about it, but it was really important. So we made a number of recommendations to help with this, and we studied the cultivars that do best in the garden these days. So this reinvigoration gave us the chance to choose companion plants for the heaths and heathers, and we were trying to think about how we could enhance sustainability in a variety of ways. And one of the ways to do that is in support of wildlife. <laughs> now, we hadn't exactly meant this wildlife, uh, but the rabbits and the woodchucks have certainly enjoyed some of the new plants that we've put in the garden. And we don't mind sharing them uh, as long as they leave us enough to enjoy for ourselves. And I really love the picture of the rabbit on the left uh, popping up from the heathers. It took me forever to get that photo because he kept going down into the heathers and then popping back up. Um, so uh, what we really meant by attracting wildlife is we were focusing on actually attracting pollinators to the garden and birds. So, um, you know, birds, bees, and butterflies, that was the focus. So we added uh, things like hummingbird mint and more butterfly weed and echinaceas and things that would attract um, the birds and the butterflies and the bees, plants that have berries for birds. And I think that it's been quite effective. It really has boosted the numbers of those. We've seen a big change in the years. Now, you might wonder how we used the original Olmsted plant lists in the reinvigoration. So I, I'm showing you here a scan of one of the original lists. You can see it says, study for southerly part. So there were lists that were associated with different parts of the garden. And um, there, were different, there were some notes on the list about how far apart you could place the plants but we couldn't use all of the exact plants on the list for a wide variety of reasons. So how do we use the list? Well, one thing we can do is riff on a theme. So if in the Olmsted list, they mentioned a plant like Deutzia gracilis rosea, which is a small shrub that you see pictured on the upper left, we do have Deutzia gracilis in the garden, but we added, a Deutzia called Chardonnay Pearls, what a name, and it has yellow foliage. So that yellow foliage is great for contrast in the garden and it really brightens things up. So that's the idea of taking an original plant on the list and riffing on a theme. Another way that we would use the list is to use some of the same or similar plants, but in a different area from where they specified. For example, on the Olmsted list, plants that are small rock garden plants like basket of gold and rock cress and creeping phlox, those were mentioned as being used in the South Triangle. Well, if you look at the picture on the left, that's the triangle today. And in the triangle are some azaleas who, and, and those have been there for a long time and they had grown very large. And we really didn't have the conditions in the triangle to use these smaller rock garden plants. But we have the conditions over on the rock face in the heather bed. So we can use similar plants from the list, but use them in a slightly different place. Another thing that we could do is use new varieties that are available in the nursery today. Now the Olmsteads on their plant list 
for things like heather, foxglove, peony, primrose, poppies, they wrote, use them in variety, meaning the varieties available to you in the nursery. And that's what they did in the 1930s and that's what we can do now. So for poppies, they also wrote, and I love this, scattered through among other perennials on both sides to be determined at time of planting. Well, I love poppies. Jennifer Happa loves poppies. Lots of us love poppies. So we've used many different varieties that we are able to get from the nursery and we've sprinkled them throughout the garden. They're meant to be surprise elements. And you can see a few photos at the bottom that show them in combination with many other plants. And look, I've got lots of photos of poppies with other plants. I think I could put a whole book together of poppies with other plants. So that's another way that we can use the Olmsted list as inspiration. Now, there are a few plants on the 1935 lists that we now know are invasive. And of course, they didn't know that at the time. So one example would be Japanese barberry, Berberus thunbergii. So we're going to look at that list, uh, that plant on the list, and we're not going to use that today. But if we wanted to get that same effect, maybe we just want the color. Now, it, it gets that color in the fall, but maybe we want that color year round. So we are using something like the dwarf smoke bush. You see a picture there, Winecroft Black, that has a similar color, but it doesn't really have the same habit as the barberry. So if we wanted the same habit, we might use uh, something like Deutzia gracilis nico. You see a picture of it there. It has that small shrub habit. And in the fall, it gets very colorful foliage. We also, we used a, a dwarf abelia called Abelia Rose Creek. And it has the effect of red foliage, but that really comes from the calyxes that turn red in the fall. So we are avoiding the invasive plants, but we might make some new selections that reference the original Olmsted list. Now people have asked me, well, what do you mean by the framework plan? Well, the framework plan is documentation. Six notebooks of documentation and some digital files to go with it. So a lot of documentation. And what we included in that were things like the guiding principles, the design intent as planted plans, existing conditions maps, plant lists of various types, a maintenance plan, detailed, staffing plan, discussion guides on various subjects. And I'm just showing you here an example. I'm not gonna, you don't wanna see a lot of pictures of documentation, but for example, uh, on the upper uh, left-hand side, you see a sketch that I made of the plants that were in the perennial bed after we did the reinvigoration. And then that sketch would be digitized into um, the map that you see on the bottom right. And by the way, we mentioned that the perennial bed is 600 linear feet long. And you can see that this is zone one and there are 11 zones of this in just the perennial bed side. So it takes a fair amount of time to put together that kind of thing. But why would we do all of this? Why all these documents? The documents provide continuity and guidance for staff and management now and hopefully for years to come. They support fundraising efforts. They're a framework of needs for the garden. For example, for the maintenance plan, we tried to detail what needed to be done in the garden every month, every day. You know, what needs to be done specifically? How many hours does it take to do it? How many staff are needed to do that? what materials are needed to do it. And this really helps when, uh, when you're trying to get funding for additional staff or for supplies and you can, uh, you can show in detail why you need that funding. So documentation is part of what needs to happen to ensure that the garden continues to thrive. We have been looking at the evolution of the garden itself over 85 years. But is the garden just an artfully arranged collection of plants? You know, who is all this for? The Heather Garden is a public garden. It's a public park. It's here for everyone. 
at heart, it's an experience, one that each of us takes whenever we walk through the garden. So in the end, it's for us and it's about us. It's about people, it's about neighbors, visitors, staff, volunteers. It's about programs and partnerships and education and community. A walk through the Heather Garden is at once a very personal experience and a shared community experience. Even now, as we visit singly and in smaller groups with our masks on, and maybe especially now. Today, we again find ourselves at a time of city fiscal crisis, among other threats and worries. We are today's stewards of this special place. So how will we maintain it? How will we preserve Rockefeller's vision and the spirit of Olmsted's design and continue its evolution? The framework plan is in place and the staff and the volunteers, they work tire tirelessly and they're so knowledgeable and dedicated, but there are simply not enough staff or resources. And those historic photos from the 1970s and the early 80s, they serve as an example of where we do not want to go. So as a community, we do all need to be stewards. And I don't just mean donating money, although yes, please donate money to the trust if you can. Go to forttryonparktrust.org. You can donate money, you can become a member. But the garden also needs our time. It needs our attention, our caring, our watchful eyes and our voices. I think of a garden like a poem written over a long period of time. As creators and caretakers, we have the chance to write a stanza in this garden's history. I hope we'll be able to build upon and evolve the Olmsted Rockefeller legacy of the Heather Garden as a place where we can connect to nature, find peace and beauty and solace and healing, discovery and joy. So I hope we have some time for questions still. We do. You? Um, Good. Thank you so much, Rhonda. That was just so beautiful. Uh, your passion and your knowledge and your dedication. Uh, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to do this. I, I, I love uh, going through photos and, and some of the research materials and the archives. It's so interesting. Um, so I would like to um take questions the, i'm going to kick off one question that we got Rhonda, during your presentation which was fabulous by the way thank you um was what uh plants from or are any of the plants that were originally on site in 1935 still in the garden i know the yews are original uh perhaps the mock orange is original are there other uh plants that we have in the garden today that are the same exact plant that was there 85 years ago? That's a good question. Meaning not just the same types of plants, but the actual plant that was there. And as Jennifer said, um, some of the, the ewes, the very large ewes, and we've lost a few over time that we had to take out. But one of the ways that we've tried to preserve those ewes, um, and John Kelly has done such a beautiful job, is to limb them up so that you see the beautiful architecture of the bark um, and then, you know, cut out some of the sections that aren't doing so well. So they've lasted. Yeah, maybe the mock oranges. Um, I'm trying to think of something else that I'm sure was there originally. And, and, you know, that 1980s restoration, and it would be interesting to ask Nicholas Quinnell about this too, what, um, they really had to get rid of so much because it was in such bad shape at the time. Um. We're getting so many, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to unmute everyone. That might not be such a good idea because everyone is just going on and on and on about wonder, how wonderful your presentation was, Ron. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> uh, there, there are a few questions. Somebody wanted to know when, do, roughly when did that so Siberian elm start to grow? It's in the heather bed. I know it's been here. I've lived in the neighborhood over 18 years. It's been here long before that, but uh, any sense of when that uh, might have begun to grow. 
you know, we've never had that. That, sure. needed. that, that was not part of the original plan, but it was one of those things that we all grew attached to. And so we- Right. Right. My understanding about the Siberian elm, which is smack, well, it's not exactly in the middle, but it feels like it's smack dab in the middle of the heather bed. It's huge, huge Siberian elm. What happened? Can you hear me? Uh, happened. Okay, oh, there you can you hear me now? Okay. Sorry. Not sure what happened. Um, so, uh, my understanding is that it came from a volunteer, a seedling that was not intended to be there and then grew and was left there. Um, so I don't know if that's urban legend and I don't know when that started. Um, certainly, like you said, I mean, people, I wonder if someone who's listening in has um, been around the garden long enough to remember when it wasn't there. But since it, it kind of volunteered there and it became a really key feature and it's interesting because the plantings under the Siberian elm are, are quite different from the other plantings in the garden because we have such different conditions there. The rocks are really close to the surface and you can't um, grow anything there that has deep roots. So we've kind of done this hosta tapestry underneath the Siberian elm. But I'm, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know exactly when that was, when it started growing and was left there. Okay, we can dig into that um, and, and find out for everyone. Um, somebody wanted to know uh, if any of the plants in the Heather Garden are native to this region. Oh, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Many, many, many. Now, in the 1930s, um, when they were planting a garden like this, it wasn't really in vogue to be using native plants in a garden like this. Now, it was important to use them in the park as a whole. I mean, they wanted a naturalistic experience in the park, but when you're planting something kind of garden-esque, um, you're often using what they would have considered more exotic plants um, in that kind of situation. But we definitely, uh, not only were there some native plants when we started working on the garden in 2009, but we made a really conscious effort to add a lot of native plants to the garden because we can do that now. They're available in the nurseries for us, not so much the case in the 1930s. And we were adding them, as I mentioned before, particularly to um, attract pollinators and to add to the ecology of the region, region. So there are many, many native plants. And if you look at some of the documentation that I made for the reinvigoration of the heather bed, you'll see that we were specifically calling out which plants were native, which plants were pollinator plants, uh, which plants were, were um, on the original Olmsted list. So it was a very important consideration in the reinvigoration. We have one comment that someone wanted to share that they saw the garden in the 1970s and, um, and, and they've gotten to see it recently. I don't know if that's, they said, thank you, great presentation, great photos. So it's wonderful to see the transformation. Uh, does it, if anybody wants to raise their hand, are there any more questions? And again, if anybody has any photos from the 1950s of the garden specifically, because I, you know, we can find pictures of people in the garden in the 1950s. They've shared them on the wonderful memory book that you have on the trust site. But I, I couldn't find pictures specifically of what the garden looked like after that 1955 um, restoration, which turned out to have some repercussions to it. But <laughs> it's interesting. Um, just one comment. It's interesting uh, what mindsets were in place. You know. Uh, in the 50s, I guess, there was this rejection of anything that was deemed historical, right? And so that's why there was sort of an abandonment of what the Olmsted, you know, design intent was, and there was a, a, a goal to be more modern. Unfortunately, we saw that and we lost a lot of architectural treasures as well. You know, similarly, when the Olmsted brothers designed the park for uh, Rockefeller, it was during a, an era where, you know, people were generally more compliant, uh, right? And they designed the park to sort of be uh, uh, sort of a complete, uh, completely separate from the city, right? Uh, and so we've got that large retaining wall along the Broadway side, side of the park. 
So because it was designed in a time when people were compliant, it was okay that there weren't open sight lines. It was okay that there was this uh, retaining wall and sort of a planted berm. And we've had to take a little bit of creative license uh, to revise that uh, design intent based on how people actually use the park today. And so that, that's meant opening up the sight lines on the Broadway side, doing the greeting gardens, you know, we did have a lot of Norway ma maples, <laughs> clearing those out, and, you know, planting low ground cover so people could see in and see out. Um, are there other, in, in looking back at the design, Rhonda, are there any other specifics in the Heather Garden where you think, oh, it was such a different era, they really, they really weren't considering, you know. Um, well, you know, there, it's really interesting what you say because when you're doing um, a reinvigoration of a space and you're trying to keep it up to date with what we need today, and yet you're trying to stay with um, the spirit of a park or a garden. I mean, that's really the essence of it is trying to keep the spirit of it because you have to adapt to the changing times in so many ways, like you mentioned. And in the garden, for example, um, you know, this has a very specific style to that garden. And right now, a very popular style is one that might be, um, for example, like the highline plantings. That's a very popular style and that uses a lot of grasses. In the 1930s, they wouldn't have used grasses like that. So uh, when you look at this garden, you might think, oh, I'd love to put some grasses in. Wouldn't that look beautiful? But we had to hold back from that because it wasn't part of the spirit of what they were doing in the 1930s. So it's constantly this kind of balancing act. The garden was created to be a stroll garden, and it doesn't really have places to sit within the garden, even though you can sit on the benches up above the garden and you can look down into it. So, um, you know, today we kind of wish we had places maybe along the way that people could sit. And the uh, way the garden is laid out doesn't really give us the opportunities to create those kinds of things. So, you know, there are things today that we might do differently, but we have to kind of try to balance that out with what we can do that still maintains that um, that historical spirit of what they were going for but meets the needs today. The other thing I would say is that you know that that central path through the garden is very narrow and it makes for an intimate garden walk and experience but it doesn't do us uh, it, you know, it, it's not helpful right now when we have so many people who want to be in the garden that we're so happy that so many people want to be in the garden, but, um, you know, with uh, the isolation and, uh, and uh, everyone being outdoors all the time now, we have such an influx of visitors and we have that very narrow path, including when we used to be able to meet in groups and we'd go down the main path with a tour and you can't, you know, hear the person all the way on the end. So, having the path be that narrow uh, and some parts of the garden not as accessible for people with disabilities. You know, there are those kinds of things that we, we try to update as best we can, but can't necessarily do because the bones or the structure of the garden may not always allow that. Right. Our workaround has been, we sort of put up barricades to say, you know, help us you know, maintain social distance, safe social distancing and the, the signs and, and most people are compliant. Yeah, absolutely. But that narrow path, it's, um, you know, it's beautiful and difficult both at the same time. We wouldn't mind having a little wider path through the garden. So I think, I think that's like the equivalent of like several city blocks. So essentially, once you start in, you've got to go all the way around to it. <laughs> right. There are no resting places, no seats. And, um, and uh, yeah, I know people have come to the garden and say, well, wait a minute, where, you know, I, I need to be headed to a bench and I don't see one there. <laughs> That's something we may take some creative license with. Right. I know we've talked about that a little bit. We might have to do a little. We're not thinking about it. Back in that day, there certainly wasn't consideration for people who might have different levels of ability. So when we re were restoring staircases, we do add a railing, um, those types of things. Where we can make something ramped, you know, we are doing that. But we do have the significant elevation changes. Uh, a few more questions. Someone asked if there are photo contests for the park. There are. Uh, we also have calls for photo. Um, most weeks we have a community photo of the week uh, via our social media and, and um, you know, Facebook and Instagram. 
And sometimes we do include that in our weekly e-newsletter. Um, and then we do sometimes for our sort of overall photography inventory, because we have so many artistic people and our park is so photogenic, we do sometimes do call for photos. Sometimes those become note cards that we sell to benefit the park. Sometimes those are used for publications to help promote the park. So we do, uh, if you're not on our e-newsletter, you can email info at fortriumparktrust.org and then you'll find out about upcoming opportunities. Um, someone shared that the garden saved our sanity the past few months and has inspired us to learn all about the beautiful plants that emerged month after month. All new to us, we are so grateful for your work. So nice. Oh, thank you. That's so wonderful to hear. Well, that's why we do this work. And that's why I love working on public shared garden spaces because um, you know I really believe that we need that connection to nature and it makes a big difference in our lives. And, um, you know, Olmsted wrote beautifully about uh, how there was, you know, this direct, um, you know, effect on the spirit and on the body um, in experiencing these natural spaces. Um, most of you know, uh... My family has had a garden center since 1910. So I, I also have green blood. And while my master's is in urban planning, my, I feel like my calling is healing the hardscape, bringing nature and beauty to people. So Fort Tryon is, is a treasure. And I, I moved here after one walk through it uh, 18 years ago. So we're, so we're also fortunate, or many of us are fortunate to have such ready access to it. Um, another question is what percentage roughly of new, of new plants need to be planted yearly? What so, planted yearly? It uh, there might be two okay. ways. To, you know, I think it, in yeah. terms of replacing the heats and heathers, it depends on how harsh the winter, the prior winter was. Um, and then, but for the most part, I think it's, we've got the, Rhonda added the shrub layer back in, we have a lot of perennials, and then we have less annuals than we ever have. Right, that was a, that was a goal in uh, the reinvigoration, was to reduce uh, dependency on annuals, because annuals are the plants that you put in every year, and then you take them out, and you put them back, you know, you put new ones in, and they're very resource intensive, both in terms of labor and water. So uh, one of the goals of the plan was uh, to be sure that the perennials and the shrubs were robust enough that we could reduce the dependence on annuals. And annuals, like many public parks, are used you know, primarily at the entrances. And then we use some very natural looking ones that blend in well with the perennials um, in the beds, but um, very few in the heather bed. Uh, and really that was intentional to reduce that. So that's with annuals. And then as Jennifer said, you know, as far as um, the regular plantings, for a while we were doing a lot because the projects continued until we had gotten all the way through the heather bed. And, you know, first we started on the perennial bed and then going through the heather bed. And I remember, you know, areas where we still, you know, a couple project areas we would walk by and think, oh, we got to get to that someday. So we would have, you know, bigger plantings when we were doing that. Now it's more a matter of replacing plants that maybe didn't make it through the winter and also keeping that heath and heather collection uh, up to snuff as Jennifer mentioned. So, um, so, you know, we always plant in the spring and in the fall when plants are available and those are good times to plant. Just depends on what kind of weather we have that year more than anything. And I'll just add that having, having it a bit more regimented with the repeats, with the shrub layers, uh, with the perennials, uh, and minimizing the dependence on the annuals has meant it's been easier to fundraise for the garden. It's been easier to sustain the garden. Uh, it's be, been easier to plan for the garden um, and also to sort of plan uh, how we're going to deploy our amazing volunteers. So it, it's been invaluable to have that, that Heather Garden Framework Plan that, that Lyndon and, and Rhonda put together for us. And um, we have... Oh, uh, I just might mention uh, relative to what we were just talking about too, is that uh, it's really important that you see us out there in the spring and the fall doing some plantings of shrubs and perennials because um, one of the things that people uh, sometimes will do is if you let too much time go by, years and years they go by, and you're not refreshing things when they die and you're not keeping up with it, 
it is that, um, you know, it costs you a lot more in the long run, you have to do a fuller renovation. So in all the public spaces that I work in, with all of the clients, I try to stay with them for a long period of time. And I try to, um, to plant every single year and keep up with it little by little by little. And if we keep up with it, then ultimately that keeps costs down and it prevents the place from uh, getting, um, you know, overgrown, which can happen so fast in the garden if you don't really stay on it. We had one question, Rhonda, about why the boxwood was taken out. Um, do you want me to answer that or do you want to? Um, go ahead and I, I'll add to it, but so at the north end of the perennial border, uh, we had boxwood that ha had essentially grown to, I think, six feet in height. Um, and it obstructed the view when you were on the, the north end of the promenade. You could no longer see sort of, you couldn't, uh, you wouldn't experience the whole open view shed that had been in the sort of the original design intent of the Olmsted plan. So we did take out those boxwood and we replaced them with uh, lower boxwood and we keep it more manicured now so that you have those open sight lines. So you're, you're capturing a glimpse of the Hudson. We've reopened that window uh, to the Hudson River, but we still have um, boxwood. Yeah, and I will just also say about that, that, you know, we really, um, I don't know exactly when boxwood was planted in that area, but it, it's a little bit out of keeping with maybe what we're seeing in the, in the rest of the garden. So it was really hard decision about what to do about the boxwood. So we, we did replant there in order to maintain what had become historic at that point. But you know, how historic is it? How far back do we go? I'm not really sure. I, I would hazard a guess it wasn't there in that spot in 1935. Um, but uh, you know, it really doesn't appear uh, in other places in the garden. And also since that time, uh, you have to really be careful about boxwood because boxwood blight has been a big problem. And so, you know, you have to keep a careful eye on it and it's not something that we would want to add widely into the garden now. Uh, we have a question, two questions is, uh, uh, can we have a similar lecture on the Alpine garden? We probably can. We uh, work with the National Association of Olmsted Parks and we've been uh, approached by um, some Olmsted, Olmsted Junior uh, historians. So we, we would, we'll, we, the Fortran Park Trust would love to offer that if people are interested, absolutely. Um, someone asked, how did Shearing of the Heathers complete with the parade with bagpipes begin? Um, I believe Originally, the, uh, the Parks Department, the Fortran Trust, um, partnered with the Northeast Heather Society on selecting which species um, would be most viable given the conditions we have in the Heather Garden. Um, so that partnership was formed. They came every year. We decided, it sort of was organic. We decided to make it more of a community celebration, to make it more participatory, and not just about maintaining or technical assistance from the Northeast Heather Society. So Nancy Bruning with the Fort Tryon Park Trust and others brought in the bagpiper. We decided uh, to invite people to bring in instruments. Um, John Kelly said, why don't we help people propagate their own, you know, plants. Um, and it became more of uh, this uh, official uh, declaration of spring. Um, and it's just, uh, it's caught on over time. And we were really sad we couldn't do it this year. Um, but hopefully, hopefully next year uh, we, can, we can gather again. Um, yeah, music is also a wonderful way to, to sort of celebrate the, the beauty and the community uh, for Trine Park. So we really hope to bring that back. Um, well, I included a photo of that, but I should have, I should have mentioned the Northeast Heather Society too, um, because certainly, you know, that partnership has been important and keeping that Heath and Heather collection strong. Um, so we have a, uh, so somebody wonderf wonderfully did the calculations. The perennial border is about five city blocks long, that center path um, between the perennial border and Heather Garden, Heather Bed, five city blocks long, thank you. Um, 
First, thank you for an excellent presentation. Thank, uh, second, how have the new plantings changed the types of fauna that visit and live in the park? Is Leslie Day still on? She is, Leslie. <laughs> <laughs> Leslie <I'm> might, <laughs> might want to comment a little bit on that. Well, you know, I have to remember that scene of that young male deer <laughs> coming out of the we have, to, we have to show that again. <laughs> we have to, because that was so extraordinary. Once in a lifetime viewing of a young buck, <laughs> the poor little thing. I, you know, again, Rhonda, we'll, we'll, we'll re, we re, re-feature it. Right. I think I, I'm, I'm afraid that I'm going to be remembered by posterity for that video rather than any design work that I did in the other garden. The anyway. reaction. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, you know, the woodchucks, I mean, I don't know of any other park in Manhattan that has woodchucks. They're fantastic. <laughs> and I, you know, I think of the time that this one mother with a little baby said, there's a, there's a woodchuck carrying a little rat. And this one mother woodchuck was evacuating her nest and carrying one little woodchuck baby at a time from one nest, from one burrow to another for whatever reason. And I know John hates the woodchucks, <laughs> but they don't seem to do that much damage. And it's so wonderful to see them. And then we have skunks. And uh, you know, I, I mean, I've been here nine years. And I'd never seen skunks in New York City parks. And I lived in Riverside Park for almost 40 years at the Boat Basin. So we have amazing animals up here. And I, I don't know what it was like before nine years ago, but. We, ha we have had deer for quite some time. Um, more recently, we have, uh, and Eliza, uh, sorry if I'm outing you on the question. So it's not just the ecology of Fort Tryon that's improved. It's, you know, we're part of the ecological corridor, Rivers, uh, Riverdale Park, Inwood Hill Park, Fort Tryon. Um, so as the uh, eco overall ecology of the, the corridor has improved, you know, we've, we've had, you know, high, um, uh, uh, the groundhogs, the skunks, the raccoons, we've had a greater diversity of owls in the parks. Um, Cynthia Holden, rightly a birder, uh, who's fabulous, you know, rightly points out we, we're seeing a growing diversity of bird species, um, coyotes, uh, snakes. Last year's Halloween parade through the park, we had snakes, which was wonderful for the kids, but maybe not for <laughs> some other people. Um, and lots of a growing population of red-tailed hawks. Um, so. And this has always been, you know, oh, a key, uh, uh, or on, on the Hudson River and overhead. So, oh, sorry. And and of course, this has always been a, a key stop or a path on the migration corridor for birds. Um, so I don't know whether, and, and, you know, of course, you you can't really go by that because the bird populations have had so many challenges, you know, otherwise. But you know, we hopefully have added plants that have attracted. Uh, different types of birds. And then as far as um, insects, you know, pollinators and for bees and butterflies, um, my experience is anecdotal. I, I see them on the plants that we've added to the garden in the past years, and I see them in great numbers and more than I used to. So I think that um, it's really boosted the, those numbers. So I don't see any more questions just lots of thanks and praise um, we want to respect everyone's time um, oh everyone's saying we are so grateful to you we're so grateful for you thank you all for your support of Fort Tryon for people who give of their time by working in the Heather Garden with us or showing up at one of our three monthly stewardship days uh, thank you to Rhonda for her dedication and passion um, our Heather Garden volunteers, people who, who um, provide amazing photographs of our park, people who donate financially. It really takes a village and a region uh, to sustain uh, this treasure. If you want to find out more about the birds we have in the park um, or the pollinators, um, you can go online for trainparktrust.org. You can also make a donation there to support the park or or give it a birthday gift uh, in honor of its um, 
85th birthday. Um, we really uh, um, want to ensure, uh, particularly as the, the city's fiscal picture is fluctuating, that we, ha we have the private resources we need to fill in the gaps uh, to sustain all the investments we've, we've been making uh, since 1998. And the community has helped us make. We do not want to uh, go back to the 80s. So we'd love any and all help uh, that you can provide. Help us to grow our giving, either by giving yourself or getting others uh, to give uh, to the park. Um, I think we all want to give Rhonda a round of applause for her amazing, informative presentation. We Thank are you so much, Jennifer. And thank you for everybody, uh, for all of you tuning in. What a great community that we have. And so now that we can't see each other in a big group in the garden at the moment, but it's nice to see your faces here. And, uh, and I'm sure I'll see you in the garden soon. Thank you, Rhonda. And we are going to put this up on the Trust website. So stay tuned uh, uh, to fortrainparktrust.org. Um, thank you all so much for coming. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank Good night, you. everybody. Night. Oh, and if you have a question that you didn't share tonight or that pops up in your mind, just email info at fortrainparktrust.org. It's not your only opportunity for uh, brainstorming or, or inquiry. <laughs>